you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party Party people in the place to be is the BKMC, the MCEO, Talib Kweli. This is the world's best podcast, the People's Party. And as always, and as usual, I have my lovely and talented, a very intelligent, and my good friend, Jasmine Lee, in the place to be. What's up, Jasmine? How you feeling? You know, I've always wanted to be a man. And today, at least. Wait, what? Today, at least, we get to interview someone who is my birthday twin, so it's kind of like interviewing me as a man. That is too much information. Yeah. <laughs> However you want to identify is fine. The show is very woke and intersectional. Here we go. Just like our guest. <laughs> our <laughs> guest segue. today <laughs> is, is a comedian and actor, one of the greatest in the game, uh, master of observational humor. He's one of the first, no, he was the first comedian to get a Netflix special. This move opened the floodgate for comedians all over the world. A lot of stand-ups have this man to thank for paving the way. He is an award winner, Peabody, International Emmy Award winner, but we're not going to get into those type of accolades because this man is a man of the people. His comedy specials, Outsource, Red, White, and Brown, The Green Card Tour, Notorious, Almost Famous, and Deported have done very, very, very well, have touched audiences all over the world. He is no stranger to films as well. Uh, from the take to break away to source code, one of my personal favorites, uh, to just name a few. He's lent his voice talents to shows, wonderful shows like Bob's Burgers and Bojack Horseman and Family Guy. He is one of the hardest working comedians and DJs that I know. And I know a lot of comedians and I know a lot of DJs. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Canada's own, the pride of Brampton, Ontario, Russell Peters in the place to be. Peace, God. Peace to the gods. What's today's mathematics, Russell? Word. Science is seven, B. Um, <laughs> How you feeling? Tired, but good. It's you, so I woke up. I appreciate it. You know. We're going to try to keep you awake. No, you're good. For this whole podcast, as opposed to Drink Champs, which puts you to sleep. Well, then it put me to sleep. I put myself to sleep by drinking <laughs> too damn much. <laughs> and then smoking weed, which I don't smoke weed. So right. it, was, it was an interesting night. Shout out to Smoke Champs. Shout out to Nori. Shout out to EFN. Oh, yeah. DJ <laughs> Effin, I called him. I, I always thought it was Effin. It's me Effin. Too. It is Effin. Right? It's like the vodka. Yeah. I thought Effin. I always thought Eric owned Effin vodka. <laughs> Shout out to DJ FN50 EFN. These, these are our, that's our cousin podcast. Mm. Um, I've been on Drink Chance five times. I feel like I need a green jacket at this point. You mm. should. Yeah, that's the Masters. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's it me, me and Jada Kiss and maybe Ja Rule are the only ones who've done it five times. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I did it twice. I did it once with Bumpy Knuckles and once with Grandmaster Kaz. Bumpy Knuckles is one of the most gangster hip hop personalities ever. Uh, I think that's how he's viewed, but. Yes. I know him so well. His name is Bumpy Knuckles. Right. I mean, you know, he used to be he Freddie Fox. He has two Fox. Glocks. <laughs> Not used, just one Glock. Yeah. Two Glocks. That's what he talks about. He's Freddie Fox with the triple X. Yes. Not just one X. Yes, yes. He was he was way ahead of his time. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, but that's my brother right there, Bump. No, and shout out to Grandmaster Kaz. Grandmaster Kaz and you together at Tony Touch Party introduced me to Melly Mel. Oh, yeah, that was, oh, yeah, that was the first that. time you I met just, You still had your suitcase with you that day. Remember? I did. I went straight to that party. It was yeah. raining and everything. Yeah, that was wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man, I had to um, support. Those are my brothers, uh, you know, Danny Castro, Tony Toka. But um, I had never met Melly Mel, and he's integral to my DNA as an MC. so I want to thank you. That's, that's wild that you never met. It's always weird to me when, like, New York rappers never met other New York rappers. Yeah. I'm like, I can understand if you were from, like, outside of New York. You never met him, but... Yeah, well, I feel like Melly Mel only comes out for specific events. I mean, I've definitely been in a building with him, but I never had that introduction. I cast somebody who I have, I've met many times. Yeah. You know. Kaz, yeah, thank the, you for that. It's funny, because I met Kaz from Mel. Okay. Because Mel and I were, were friends first. Yeah. A shout out to my man Dave New York. Rest in peace. Ah, Dave. I yeah, love man. That guy. He was the guy that really introduced me to you as a comedian. Hmm. Yeah. Russian Dave. Russian Dave. Russian Dave. That's right. That's I right. didn't know that. He's one of my favorite people. That was my best friend in Los Angeles. Really? Yeah, absolutely. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah, he used to be like, I'm going to the Russell Peters show. I'm like, you know Russell Peters? He's like, yeah, he's a hip-hop head. I'm like, Russell Peters is a hip-hop head? Like, I didn't really know that much about you oh, really? back then. I mean, I knew about you. You know, but you're forgetting. We did meet before. Okay. In Toronto. We were judging uh, um, That's right. an MC battle. That's right. Judging an was MC that the been... one where the guy Blake Carrington was on? Yeah, that sounds like it. 
Yeah, Blake, and, and Blake was an, Carrington. There was an Indian Great kid. Great rap name. There was an right. Indian kid who called himself Sam Osa. <laughs> yeah, I do remember this. <laughs> and I was like, yo. And I remember saying, your name's fucking Samosa? <laughs> <laughs> That's like a black guy going, I'm chick in. You know? <laughs> I'm Fry Ed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man. So speaking of chicken, mm. your dad worked at a chicken plant. He certainly did. You like that segue, right? Yeah, that was very good. Very slick. Okay, yeah. I'm getting good at this yeah, I like, interview stuff. Yeah. Uh, your parents left India in 1965. That is also correct. Working class people. Very working class. Um, how did that upbringing solidify your values as a comedian? Well, see, not, us, my family not being the traditional Indian family at all, <laughs> My dad was Protestant. My mom was Catholic. So they compromised and I went to Catholic school. <laughs> okay. Interestingly enough, never got fondled. Um, <laughs> oh. uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, my parents, they're both Anglo-Indians. I don't know if you know what an Anglo-Indian is, but you might have you might have notes on it. I don't know. Just a little bit. You're described like that on your Wikipedia page. Well, because I am. My yes. Anglo-Indians are proud to say they're Anglo-Indians. Okay. Because we're literally a dying breed. Mm -hmm. There will be more Anglo-Indians, mm -hmm. but they won't be the same Anglo-Indians that my parents were. Now, break it down. Okay, so back in the day, the, obviously when the British were in India for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. the British... My dad tells the story like this. He used to tell the story like this. He said that the, the British were encouraged to marry local because it was too difficult of a journey for them to bring British women from England because of the boats and all that, mm -hmm. and they could die on the way. So they were encouraged mm -hmm. to go local. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my cousin, Patty, she did, um, she didn't do uh, ancestry or nothing. She just literally went through our family photos because she's 80 years old. So she went through, and she's my first cousin. Mm -hmm. um, she went through all the photos and pieced it all back to this one lady. Wow. And so what it was was, 1830, uh, some British soldier knocked up a Muslim lady, mm -hmm. and then he fucked off and went back to England. It's like reverse Morris in Spain. Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. And so when, when so to be an Anglo-Indian, the father has to be British and the mother has to be Indian. And if the mother is British and the father is Indian, that's a Eurasian. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the, the side story is I, I was at a, the Jungle Book premiere years ago because I was in the movie, and mm -hmm. Ben Kingsley was there. Mm -hmm. And I meet him and I go, oh, Mr. Kingsley, I, I, I broke down that he's a Eurasian because his real name's Krishna. That's right. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm an Anglo-Indian. Then I explained the break that, did the breakdown and he stopped and he went, huh, never stop learning. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, I just taught, you I just taught, taught Ben Sir, Kingsley something. Sir Ben Kingsley yeah. something. I called him Krishna too when I met him. <laughs> wow. And Because I said Krishna and he went. Like, how the fuck do you know my name? <laughs> wow. And so Anglo-Indians were um, for, were made from that. And then because there was so much of that mix happening, Anglo-Indians were being um, uh, supported by the British because basically we were their dogs. Yeah. If you really think. I know the Anglo-Indians going to be mad as shit at me for saying this, but really that's what, we, that's what they were doing. They were breeding yeah, us I mean, mm -hmm. to look like the Indians – and to, and culturally be British, which is what we were. And not all of them look like me. I'm the most Indian, one of the most Indian-looking ones. Mm -hmm. They generally look more like my manager, Paul. They could look like this guy. You know, they could look like this <laughs> they guy. could look like Steve Perucci. Yeah. <laughs> they, they really can. Like, I have a cousin in England. <laughs> my cousin Christopher is, his dad is um, mm -hmm. my mom's first cousin, mm -hmm. and then his mom is white. But he is white, like with blonde hair and mm -hmm. blue eyes, but he looks like me. It makes me think of your joke when you talk about uh, going to South Africa and you talk about going to the motherland. You're like, yeah, Indians, we have our own motherland. Yeah. England. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Was good old jokes. There. That's those an old are, joke. Those are all good ones. Yeah, it's a good one. That's when I was writing good jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I was writing the snappy ones, the quick, <laughs> quick liners. Your dad is often the subject of your jokes. And what is his spot in the family dynamic as you were growing up? Well, you know, it's, it's, an in, it's still an Indian household, even though it's Anglo-Indian. But it, it, unlike other Indian households, my mom was um, a very strong woman, so she wasn't putting up with nothing. There was no, like, whatever your father says, it was like, I don't give a fuck what he says. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, my mom's 16 years younger than my dad, too. My mom, my dad was a year younger than my grandmother. Yeah, right. they, they got it in early, out there, too, <laughs> okay. you know, so, but, but my mom had just as much say as my dad did. But my dad was like the, uh, he was the academic and my mom was not. So my dad was very smart, and he was an English major, so his command of the language was very, 
impeccable. When I delved into my mom's side a little bit more, I found out that my mom's side's almost a little brown trashy. <laughs> brown trash. Wait, I never what heard is that brown one. trashy? Like, you know, like white trash? We were brown trash. <laughs> like, let's just put it this way. Nana got knocked up at 14 without being married. Oh. Oh, no, she had. Well, she got knocked up at 15, had my uncle at 16, had my mom at 17. You know what I mean? It was... Uh, she was doing her part. Like that. Yeah, yeah, she was getting it in. She was doing her part, but in her defense, the times were different. And, you know, no, she was No, 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 not one. at those times. You weren't oh. just getting pregnant by accident back then. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, times were different, all right. <laughs> yeah. I tried, yeah, so Grandma. she got knocked up, you know, not married. And then, and then my grandfather left her later on and for the Jewish lady in the building. This is in India now, in Calcutta. He left her for the Jewish lady upstairs. Wow. He had an affair with her. And then him he and the Jewish... He was taking Jew fed chances. Yeah. Him and the Jewish lady bounced out of India and moved to Australia. I never met the guy. Mm. That's why I have an affinity towards the black community, because we have a lot of the same <laughs> type of parental <laughs> problems. <laughs> from the age Absolutely of four. From done. the age of four. <laughs> now, in Notorious, um, you say that you grew up not an immigrant, but treated like an immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, can you break that down for us? Um when I say treated like an immigrant, yeah, I can break that down for you. So I was born and raised in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. But in the 70s, in Canada, the lowest form of human being you could really be was Indian. Okay. Uh, black people were about four steps ahead of us. Mm -hmm. I don't know who else, but we were the bottom. That's all I knew. And uh, so, like, if I saw, like, this white guy walking towards me in the 70s, and even at that age, and I'm, and I'm a little kid, six, seven years old, I would cross the street. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know what this guy's going to do. I profile white people, too, all the time, Russell. Yeah. No, but, no, but this wasn't a profile. <laughs> this wasn't a profile. This was, like, real. Right, I was right. like, uh-uh. They might do I'm going to cross the street. Because you literally, they would just punch you in the head for no reason. Right. They'd punch you. They'd spit on you. They'd call you names. Mm -hmm. or, or they'd do all three. Mm -hmm. They'd either do one or they'd do all three. They'd give it a nice combo, the chicken and rib combo. Wow. And, uh, and so it became one of those things where I was like, what the fuck? Uh, you know, I'm talking like very young age. Mm -hmm. wow. Five years old, I remember a dude, a grown man, when I was riding my bike through the neighborhood, I stopped in front of his house on my bicycle because it was a stop sign. I'm five years old. I'm thinking I have to obey stop signs. Mm -hmm. And I look at him and go, hi. And he sprays me with his hose. He goes, get the fuck out of here, you fucking packy. Mm -hmm. And that was our N-word. So, and I was right. like, I don't know what the fuck just happened, but I just rode my, I rode away. I was like, I went home and told my dad, I go, dad, what's a fucking packy? And he goes, who called you that? I told him, yeah. and then my dad pulled up on the guy. <laughs> What'd you say to my son? He goes, you hurt, get the fuck off my property. He goes, my dad was a little guy, but he was feisty as shit. Mm -hmm. My dad was going to fight that guy every time he saw him. That's dope. <laughs> but when I was It's fifth, on site every time I see you. On yeah. site. Yeah. And my dad was 5'4". <laughs> like, when wow. I say little, he was 5'4". Yeah. <laughs> and when I was about 15, I was walking past that man's house again. This is about 10 years later now. Mm -hmm. We're walking through, and I seen him sitting in the living room. He had a big window, big bay window. I picked up a brick. I threw that motherfucker right through his window, and then I just bolted home. <laughs> Yo, I love your family, bro. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's that 929 energy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Let's clap for that righteous violence. Yeah, I, love I was it. like, uh, hell no, yeah. I mean, you're he just, not, yeah, you know. he did deserve it. But you grew up around black folks. And that's all I grew up around. Yeah, and you developed. Because, because they were the ones that didn't pick on me. Mm. So from four years old, the only people who never bullied me and never picked on me and took me in and treated me like I was equal were black people. And this is Caribbean people, so mm -hmm. when I would hear their accent versus my parents' accent, it wasn't that far off because Anglo-Indians don't sound like but, but, but. Mm -hmm. Anglo-Indians, my dad, sounded like a British Army soldier when mm -hmm. he talked. So right. but, and I can't do that on stage because it's not funny. Right. So when my friends would call, and if I didn't want to answer, you know, you know, back then there was no call display, so I'd answer the phone. If I thought it was somebody, I would answer it like my dad, like, hello. And that would be my friend. I didn't feel like talking. like, no, Marlon, he's not home right now. I'll tell him you called and. Tell that idiot to call me when he gets you when you see him. And, and I'd hang up. And they may fully believe that I was my dad when I'd answer the phone. So Marlon has to be a real reference because I've heard oh, you say Oh, he's my his best friend. For, 40, what are you, what are you, 52? He's for 45 years have been best friends. Yeah. That's a real Jamaican name. Oh, yeah. Marlon Conroy. That's his oh, middle name. Oh, yeah. he's definitely Jamaican. Conroy oh, Jamaican. You kidding me? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's, he's just Jamaican as it fucking comes. Um, there's a lot of similarities between the immigrant communities in Toronto. And that area, Brampton, Ontario, and, mm -hmm. and and Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. Which is why, you know, as soon as you walked in, you like, what size are your sneakers? Yeah. Peace to the gods. Yeah. Like, it's all the similar references. Yeah. yeah, well, again, growing up in Toronto, it's right next to New York. Mm -hmm. 
Like to get to New York State is just a, it's a 45 to an hour drive. Mm-hmm. And literally we would bullshit people like, oh, I'm going to New York this weekend. We just go to Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we weren't lying. Right. <laughs> I'm in New York. We're in New York, you know. But if somebody was going to New York City in the 80s, it would literally be like, oh, Yo, you going to New York this weekend? Yeah. Do me a favor. Just take this cassette and just record the radio for me. Like Red Alert, Marley Red Mall. Alert, Marley Mall, Mr. Magic. We would get Mr. All, Magic earlier than that, as, yeah. as, as, as long as we got the cassette, I, that's how I was getting my new music. Speaking of all of these wonderful rappers, you were a b-boy. Can you take us through that time My in b-boy your life? life? Man, you know what? You know, Have you had Crazy Legs on here yet? Not yet, but we need Crazy Legs. You should. Open invitation. He, you, he, had I known, I, I, I didn't even think about it, but Legs. Pause. 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 Yeah, yeah. Hey, yo. <laughs> This show is, y'all are too juvenile for people's party. You know what? The worst part is That works on drink champs, not here. Yo, we don't need to be on this The worst part is Legs is is government, last name is Cologne. So so Legs, you're open colon for you. Uh, Shout out to Legs and shout out to the uh, Puerto Rock Steady. Oh, yeah. And which the last time I saw you was in, oh, yeah, we were in Puerto San Juan together. DJing yeah. together. That's right. I opened that. Set. That's right. And we were watching the, the the show. Big Daddy Kane was on stage. And I'm in one like VIP balcony. And I look across and I see Russell in the other VIP balcony. You had texted me. Yeah. And I said, look, look up. And he looked up. And I'm like this. Aww. And we're doing like this. Yeah, you were on the smart side because your side, A, had air conditioning we did. and food. We yeah. did have food. Mine, I was on the dumb side. It was hot as shit. And, it was and a, and a bar that free. you had to pay for. And nothing free. Oh, no. <laughs> But how about that b-boy life? Okay, so Legs left yesterday. He was staying at my house. He could have had him on the show. Oh, man. Legs. So my b-boy life started in 82. I saw Legs in, while in a beach. In, um, in a flash dance. In flash dance. He was playing Jennifer Beals. <clears throat> yeah. Well, he did play Jennifer Beals, too, but he was... He, 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 did, he spun with, with the yeah. wig on. Yeah. I saw him there, but I had seen him on something else before, like one of those evening news, and they call it breakdancing. Yeah, graffiti rock style yeah, shit. Yeah, you know, that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, uh, what was that guy's name? Michael... Uh, Michael... Uh, Holden. Holden, Holden. Holden, Holder. Michael Holden. Holden. I met him, and he sounds exactly the same still. Sorry, Michael, if we're messing up your name. Uh-huh. Yeah, he, he's got he's like a black Jew kind of deal. Kinda. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Michael, we love you. Yeah. We know everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd seen legs breakdancing, and I was like, "What is whatever that is, I like it. And then I started trying to do it, and then I was starting to, wherever I could find it on TV. And then, you know, some of the best b-boying in music videos in the 80s was like Gladys Knight and the Pips mm-hmm. was a Save the Overtime video. Yeah. And Party Train by the Gap Band. They had yeah. all the good b-boying in it. And But you had Rocket, which had really whack b-boying. Herbie Hancock. Yeah. Great, great song. Uh, a lot yeah. of up rocking. Yeah, not even. It was a lot of those robots, remember? With the, yeah. And then uh, All Night Long had that little corny kid. And I was right. Like, Get out of here. Sad and, jumbo jumbo. Yeah. So all that stuff. But I, every time I was just jonesing for it. That was 84 now, 83, 84. And you're like, I need this, man. And I was already doing it. And I'm like, I was just sort of jonesing for it. I found Wild Style. I was like, oh, my God, what is this? I thought it was a documentary because the acting mm. was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, 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 what we gonna do? No, it was, um, we, we talking about, who, to, who told you, we talk, <laughs> we talking about? On a scale? That's because they had actual graffiti writers playing yeah, they had, themselves. They had, they had uh, Lee Quinones <laughs> playing. Lee Quinones playing Lee Quinones with no acting training at all. Okay. And the girl was a uh, graph girl too. Yeah. Uh, Lady Pink. Lady, Lady Pink, Pink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, shout out to Laura Finesse. Uh, your good friend, Big Daddy Kane, Diamond D, started from scratch, Spin Bad, you always rolling out with them. Oh, yeah, the Wild guys. Style, he spoke about Wild Style, your special had the Wild Style logo. Yeah, that was my uh, green card too. That was special. super dope. I, and I'm just gonna, I'm just going to say this. Um, I don't usually get FOMO. I'm a more evolved being. Right. <laughs> but I, I am. But I got FOMO because of your wedding, <laughs> which is terrible to say because it should be a joyous moment for you and your wife and it should have nothing to do with me. You know, honestly, my, yo, you didn't have my math then, did you? No, I didn't. Oh, but no, I just saw, I saw had like- Had you messaged me, I would have said, come through. I just saw, you know, I, I expect to see you with finesse. Mm. I expect to see you with Big Daddy Kane, certain people. But the way that your, your the, the Instagram stories played out for your wedding, I was like, yo, I'm not real hip hop if I'm not invited oh. to this guy's wedding. It was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great day. Yeah. It was dope. You got to redo it so Talib can be there now. I'm, I'll at least get you the 15 minute video. Okay, well, um, <laughs> now you um are very involved, the producer, creator of Hip Hop Evolution, right? Yes. Uh, have you seen the Raucous episode? 
Hell, of course I seen Norgus. <laughs> you know, because of um, you and Shabam Sadiq and those guys, that's where I first discovered Eminem. Right, that's right. When, so did you meet Jared? No. He started Ruckus Records. Oh, that's you? That's Jared Meyer from Ruckus. I, I loved Ruckus, dude. I, yeah. knew, I knew that any time I bought a record on Ruckus, I didn't even have to listen to it. I knew that, it, it, you know, there were, like in the house days, mm -hmm. yeah. in the house music days, you had Strictly Rhythm and New Groove. And you knew that if I went to the record store and I saw whatever Strictly Rhythm put out that day, I was like, yo, this is going to be good. And then I saw New Groove. I was like, this is going to be good. Rec Records did the same thing until they started doing those fucking weird, um, no, was just, you know, when they started doing the little sampling joints with the, mm -hmm. uh, they did those little, little, like they would loop a piece of scenario and then just make yeah. a beat underneath mm -hmm. it, you know? And I was like, nah, 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 you're losing it, kid. Mm. <laughs> but Raucous was that label just like that because, and Nervous as well. Yeah, we, um, he started Up Rocks as well, which is where this is at. And that's why we're back in business ah. together. We're, it's like the Raucous energy, but here in the podcast space. But yeah, that Shabam, that Shabam Sadiq record really is why I heard five, Eminem. The five Star Generals. Yeah, Five Star Generals. Yeah, Sound by Matu. I stole the fire truck, but the tires sucked, and the brakes were stuck, and back, back, back. And I was like, who the fuck is this guy? He's dope. Yeah, man. Um, that Raucous episode of Hip Hop Evolution is the definitive documentation of that time in hip hop. There is no other documentation that exists really of what we did on Ruckus right. and what that meant and But that's because me and Darby the guy who mm -hmm. uh, my partner there we were both we're both so we love hip hop so much we needed the elements that were never going to get talked about mm -hmm. talked about. We're like we need this. We need people to understand how important this shit is. Mm -hmm. Fuck the hits. Yeah. Everybody's going to know about the hits and all the broad strokes. I need the details. The details, yeah. the devil's in the details. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for doing that because it meant the world to me. Well, man, thank you for doing it too. I mean, I really, it was like a watch party <laughs> with me and my friends and family to watch that episode. And I, yeah. I was watching Hip Hop Evolution already. Right. It's a well done program mm -hmm. and it was very thorough, but I didn't expect it to get to my era. And that was just, I, I really loved that. And, <laughs> and we made it. And by the yeah. way, shout out to Shabar Allah. Who came to my show at the Blue Note? Oh, word. And he looks amazing, and he had a lot of amazing things to talk about. And he got going on. Uh, Shabar Allah was in a group called Population Click, which Ruckus signed. They became the Rose Family, but that was like early, early Ruckus stuff. You but. guys started in what, like ninety four, ninety five, ninety five, right? Yeah, because you really hit around ninety eight, ninety nine. Yeah. Like that's when Sadat did 1999, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that shit was dope too. Yeah, I was in that video with Harold Hunter, rest in peace. Betsy Blake directed that video from Zoo York. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> People don't understand like like the, how the hip-hop world is so intertwined underneath it all. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, Easy Mo B was at my house a couple of nights ago. And he was just telling me like wild-ass stories about Big and stuff. Easy Mo B had a group called Rappin' is Fundamental. He was talking about that. They were signed Listen, to AM. and m They were so good. They, they, I remember the song. It was Rappin' is, Rappin' is, Rappin' is, Fundamental. And then Miles Davis heard that song. Yeah, and then he did the bebop. Uh, and the, that's uh, what Miles Davis was like, those guys, if I'm going to work with hip-hop, I want to work with those guys. You know, Nile Rogers used to t uh, tell, tell me that Nile would, that, that Miles would see Nile out at Studio 54 and stuff, mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and, and Miles was like, hey, write me one of them hits, motherfucker. That sounded like Miles right there. <laughs> and I and Nile was, thought he was joking, and then mm -hmm. the next time he saw Miles again, did you make me that hit yet, motherfucker? Right. Herbie Nile, Hancock had a hit at yeah. Studio 54. Imagine walking in Studio 54 and seeing Nile Rogers and Miles Davis hanging out. Oh yeah, what a lot of fuck? cocaine. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh yeah, that's a lot of cocaine. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot of cocaine. <laughs> that's a, a lot of cocaine. Something. Hey, Nile, Nile, Nile's my man. He told me it goes a lot. He goes, you know, Nile told me he knew he had a cocaine problem because him and Keith Richards were next door neighbors in mm -hmm. Connecticut, mm -hmm. and they had both made a pact to to quit. Uh huh. And then one day Keith Richards <laughs> comes to Nile's house. He's like, Nile, you got any blow, mate. And he's like, that's when I knew I had a problem. When Keith Richards is hitting me up for blow. Right. I'm not hitting Keith Richards right. up. Right. He's hitting me up for blow. I thought I was a custy. Turns out I'm the plug. Yeah, oh, yeah, no. yeah. That's right. Uh, shout out to your brother, Clayton. Uh, you guys moved out together. And I also want to know, because I'm, I'm always curious to see how much of people's stand-up is real. So he really did move out after you at 36? Yeah, he was 36. I was so, 30. So what made you make him your manager after, you know, all, all of that? Cause I got, you know, I started getting some heat when I was like 33, 34. And, um, I didn't have a manager. Mm -hmm. I didn't have an agent, didn't have a manager. And you gotta understand if you're not from this business and you, I'm the first Indian guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's nobody I could even ask. It wasn't like somebody else. I'd be like, Hey man, what'd you do when this happened? Right. And 
and all the guys that I came up with, nobody was making it. I was like, yeah, I was friends with Dave and and uh, all those guys, but they were all in New York and they were kind of out of reach. Mm -hmm. You can't call somebody else and be like, hey, uh, what do I do? It sounds like you're fucking just making up a phone call just to talk to somebody. Mm. So you really are, you got to, I'm meandering my way through. And then I had like this guy booking me in Toronto Ed, he was a good guy, and he was, you know, but he was there right at the beginning as it started to blow, and we were both bugging out at the same time because we're like, can you believe we made 30 grand this month? And I was like, I can't believe it either. My brother was like, this doesn't make sense. You should, my brother's really smart. Mm -hmm. My brother used to do international contracts, and my brother understood, like, how to make things make more sense right. and then make more money. Mm -hmm. So he started helping me and I was like, hey, why don't you be my assistant? And he goes, I'm not going to be your fucking assistant. <laughs> I'm your older brother. I'm not going to be your goddamn assistant. Right, right. He goes, I can manage you. And I go, okay. Right. And then my brother started managing me and then Paul over there, Ken Turner, shout, shout out to, to Paulie. Paul. Um, he came on at the exact same time because Paulie lived out here and Paulie has been around the business much longer. And like, and Paulie's, Paulie's not a Hollywood guy. Mm -hmm. Paulie's just, a stand-up straight guy who I trust with my fucking family. You know what I mean? So it's he rare. wasn't a scumbag. That's, and I was that's like, a and blessing. To, to, to this day, even though he's never made me a fucking penny, he's, um, <laughs> he's terrible at his job, but what a great guy. You know what I, mean? I mean, you know, he's not a Jew. I need a Jew. You know? Oh, but, uh, my gosh. Jared, this is where you come in. Uh. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. You, early in your career, met George Carlin and he gave you some good advice. Can you share the advice that George Carlin gave? So I meet George Carlin in 1992. I've been doing stand-up three years at the time. And it was the night the Blue Jays won the World Series in Toronto. Okay. And everybody's walking up and down Young Street. I'm 20, 22 years old at the time. And uh, I'm just being a smart ass. I, I see an old white guy with a beard and a ponytail walking towards me. I'm literally just think it's a white guy that looks like George Carlin. So I elbow my friend. I go, hey, look at this fucking guy. Looks like George Carlin. And I'm being a smart ass. When he walks by, I go, how you doing, George? And he goes, how you doing, kid? And I went, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Literally, I was like, what the fuck was that? That's I, crazy. I ran after him, and I walked him back to his hotel, told him I was a comic, and asked him for advice. And and he gave me great advice. He said, listen, if you're, you get on stage as much as you can, for as, as long as you can. If you get five minutes, you take it. Mm -hmm. If you're at a bar and there's a band playing, they take a break, ask if you could do five minutes. Wow. He said, anywhere there's a microphone, you get on stage and you perform. Mm. Such and if good you advice. bomb, great. He said, if you bomb, good. That's when you learn. And yeah. then, and then I, I said, hey, at the end, I was like, thank you so much. I go, hey, maybe we'll work together one day. He goes, you never know, kid. It's a crazy business. Ten months, <laughs> ten months before he died, I worked with him. That's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. I've heard that uh, the woman who runs the comedy cellar in New York City has said that a strong Esty, as a strong bomb is better than a than a than a strong kill. You know what? You know who's the master of that? Um, embracing the bomb. Well, you know, listen. Without bombing, Bill Burr's career wouldn't be where it is right now. Mm. If it wasn't for that night in Philadelphia, where he just said "fuck you." I'm going, I'm doing my time. I'm not, I don't give a fuck if you like me or not. Mm -hmm. That's literally what solidified his career. Yeah, shout out to Bill Burr, master. And, you know, Patrice O'Neal didn't give a shit I about fucking killing. I love Patrice O'Neal. Right. You know, I used to sleep on Patrice's couch back 26 years ago mm. um, when Patrice and Keith Robinson, really it was Keith Robinson, but Patrice and Keith were roommates at the time. And Keith Robinson is such a good dude. Keith, Keith, shout out Keith Robinson as well. Keith is such a fucking... Hero. He's a hero. He, he yeah. really is a hero in the That's comedy right. world. He's the guy that he's made it so possible for so many people. Absolutely. And never once begrudged anybody. Yeah. Not in post and not in pre. He's just that guy. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Is uh, He's got a new special coming. He's had a couple of strokes now. As yeah. You know. Rodney Perry had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And Rodney Perry posted a picture of him and and Keith. And I texted Keith and I sent him the picture. I go, hey, different strokes. Like different folks? <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I'm not laughing at <laughs> And then he's like I feel attacked You're stroke shaming me Yo I, I'm friends with so many comedians yeah. That are friends with Keith Robinson He's amazing I've heard so many stroke jokes Oh my god yeah <laughs> I sent him a video last year I think Of me and Godfrey just mocking him Hey yeah. stupid walk properly You know like but like that's how we that's how comics show our love for each other To your yeah. friends yeah Because we're not gonna be fucking fake And be like Oh my God, I'm so sorry. That's a musician tactic. Like, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like as far as I'm concerned, right. musicians are the phonies. Oh, wait, not, hold on, not relax. Rappers, not rappers, okay, okay. Everyone like them, else. And them artsy too. motherfuckers with their, 
oh my god, that's so great, bro. I'm like, fuck out of here, dude. You don't give a <laughs> shit. Comedians were like, like, I, like, here's how real comedians are. When I first started making it in 2005, mm-hmm. when um, I was getting a little, the heat started turning up on me. Mm-hmm. I was in Vegas and I was standing backstage with Patrice, and Patrice looks at me and goes, "Yo, Russell, I'm not saying you're not funny." But you ain't funny enough to be having all this shit happening for you. Oh, God. <laughs> God I, bless Patrice me, O'Neill. For me, that was the biggest honor you could get from Patrice. He, A, recognized that oh, yeah. things were happening and still shit on you. I was like, if Patrice didn't shit on you, you got a problem. Yo, Dave, you know, I'm, I'm obviously good friends with him. He has so many stories about Patrice shitting on him. Oh, for sure. I remember Patrice shitting on Dave yeah. in Boston back yeah, in the day. Yeah, he has so many stories of it. Kevin Hart came on our Midnight Miracle oh, podcast well, mm-hmm. and told a story of Patrice O'Neill literally throwing shit at him at a comedy club. Yeah. Like throwing the phone book at him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He said Patrice O'Neill threw the phone book at him during a set. When I when I went to stay with Patrice and Keith back in 96, I had a Can- my first Canadian special came out in 95, 96, and I brought a VHS of it with me. And I said, yo, you guys want to see my special? Like, yeah, yeah, put it on. I put it on. It was only 22 minutes, literally like this. <laughs> <laughs> so it ends, and I go, huh? And they go, what the fuck was that? And I go, oh, come on. They go, that was the worst piece of shit I ever seen in my life. I go, what are you talking about? It was a, it was a hit in Canada. He goes, that's why fucking Canada sucks. And I'm like, damn. Man. And they got in my ass. Patrice and Keith both got, Patrice mostly, but they got in my ass. We're like, well, what the fuck was so special about that? Anybody could say those jokes. Well, wow. you got to start doing shit that is personal to you and mm. nobody can do. And it really fucking helped me. A master class. Yeah. It really was. It, like it was a shakedown but it really woke me up I was like you know it was like the first time and I used to box and the first time your chin gets checked you're like oh fuck that's, that's what this is about huh mm-hmm. and that's where you find out who you are yeah. you know what and that's the thing too and I'm I'm a comedian well you Jasmine know I know this Sorry. that's how I know you I know well he also said he's like well I met you as a lesbian how do you have a baby <laughs> um, because you kept saying I'm a lesbian at the time <laughs> I wanted every comedian no, so no one tried to fuck me, and look what happened. Yeah, well, look what happened. <laughs> look see, what see, Demi, happened. commit to your role. <laughs> <laughs> You're a shitty method actor. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it! But uh, don't give me more whiskey, please, with ice. What I will um, say. <laughs> What I will say, you said a, a bunch of things, a plethora of things. First off, the bombing, and that is like the biggest thing. Because I mean, I bombed on Comedy Central, so it's like really nobody can really. Nobody fuck saw with me it, it, so it's good. They did um, see it. Like, but you, you killed on True TV, mm-hmm. and that means something. Thank you. It's true. <laughs> when uh, World's Dumbest Criminals aired, you were. I robbed the fuck out of that bait. But um, also, Patrice O'Neill. He was so amazing because he was so truthful. And with my comedy, I tell personal stories. So it's like whether or not you think it's funny, it's true to me. And I know no one can take my stories and go on stage. Well, that's what they told me at that time. There's only one you. Right. So if you're telling your truth, you don't ever have to worry about somebody else saying the same shit as you because you're the only one living your life. Right. So Mm. if someone doesn't like what you're saying about your life, and when people say it to me and I'm like, fuck you, that was my life. Hello. I don't give a fuck if your feelings are hurt. That You get mad. You're getting mad at my reality. Then go fucking deal with your dumb reality. And then also for the George Carlin thing, I think what we were talking about is uh, about cancel culture today and how even those seven words would transfer into today's time. And I also was talking about the FCC case versus Pacifica when they uh, started with the censoring and things like that. What Pacifica? Okay, it was a radio station. Oh, and I thought you were talking about the Chrysler. It was a radio <laughs> the Chrysler Pacifica. In New Jersey, I believe. I thought you were like, well, she really is into. She's a mom now. She was talking about minivans. I get it. I know? am not. I, I have one child. I don't need a minivan. I know. Hey, listen, I had one too for a while, and then it changed. And that, it, then I fucked up. Well, <laughs> Here's the difference. And that's because you don't Shout want to put to wrappers toddlers. on your Big Macs. I know. I you know I, I like the special sauce. You know I. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I fucked up. That was kids. a callback, guys. Sorry. She, yeah, she knows what she's at. We, I we know, got I it. You, it. And I, I it. you and I were there. I caught it. The I rest of it. them were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's me on this show every day. <laughs> now, shout out to definitely uh, Comedy Now. And uh, oh, yeah, my second Comedy Now. 
the second that was out. That was my third special, Comedy Now, the one that blew me up. Okay, the one so the, that went viral, super viral. The, the one that went viral. So the first one was the one that Patrice shit on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then the second one was in ninety. So the first one was ninety five. Second one was ninety seven, and the ninety seven one sucked. Mm. Even I knew it sucked. I was like, because at the time I wasn't ready to be writing that much. I didn't understand the world of being prolific at that uh -huh. time. I didn't get it. I was like, well, what am I going to write a new act for? I'm still, nobody's seen my old act. I can still keep doing this. And, you know, when you're surrounded by mediocrity, you're going to do mediocre things. Mm. So wow. you, you level that's up. A bar. Yeah, you level up as soon as you're with somebody who's leveled up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why all these guys that go to Ohio and hang out at Dave's house come back better comics. Oh, that's for sure. True. And um, and I'm Dave. When the fuck am I not invited? I'm, <laughs> Dave, I literally took Dave Chappelle to fucking Brampton. Uh huh. When he was shooting Half Baked, uh -huh. I took him to the dumbest places ever. Right, because it was filmed up there. In it was Toronto. filmed in Canada. I hung out. I hung out in, on set almost every day, mm -hmm. and I would hang out just in Dave's trailer. He had a white Pomeranian named Thelonious. Thelonious. Yeah, I know about Thelonious. Yeah, and I would hang out and play with Thelonious all wow. day. Wow. I never David, met Thelonious, but and I've you heard about been to this Ohio dog. either. I no, well, I've been to the I've been to the juke joint, mm -hmm. the uh, the garage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been there, and like Dave's an awesome guy. And I'll say this about him: people ask me, "Has he changed?" I go, "Not when he sees you." Right. When Dave sees you, it's the same. You get the same guy that you knew. Right. So, so you, you might have less access because he's such a bigger star. But yeah, when I you mean, see him, yeah, like I'll text him, and I'll just get you know, if I text him something, I'll just get like that, you know, the heart for the like, you know, right. or the thumbs up, you know what I mean? But. I don't take it personally. I'm like, he's probably, he's got fucking bit, way better people texting him than me. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> that, <laughs> I'm like, I, I look at me and go. Speaking of text messages, I texted you one time and asked you to do a show and you never responded. Let me get back to that so I can give you a heart emoji. Right. <laughs> <laughs> go scroll about five years No, but ago. you did admit, we I were talking about admit. this okay. earlier. We may be in retrospect at that time in your career, you're like on the fucking Forbes list that maybe she shouldn't have been asking you to do her show. Right. <laughs> no, I, you know, I would, I would, I, here's the thing. I would, I love doing that kind of stuff. Stuff that seems completely like you shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. That's, that's right up my alley. I just, but I think I was on tour. I was probably out of the country when you did it. So by the time I was going to respond, I was like, ah, oh, it didn't make sense. Sure, we'll go with that. But, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I always talk about, it's like so many different levels of celebrities. Cause I have a lot of celebrities phone numbers in my phone, but everybody don't text back. And right. Talib was actually one of the main people that didn't text back for a long time. I definitely don't text back. And he Now won't. he does it just to get by. Just to get by. Just, Just to, to get, get by. by. <laughs> Talib will message you back. And I do the same exact here on top. Talib will message you back literally a month later. And they'll be like, and now can you do such and such and such and such? I'm like, this was 10 years ago now. Oh, yeah. That's exactly yeah, what I, I do. You know, but I don't take it personal. I, I, I hit him when I was in Puerto Rico and he hit me same day. Oh, thanks. A okay. few hours later, but the same day. But that's because he kind of read it and went, fuck, I know I'm going to see this guy. I'm in Puerto Rico. We're yeah, in, I'm in Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. We're on an island. There's no way I'm not <laughs> going to see this guy. I better respond. Right. <laughs> I call myself, uh, if, if you're ranking celebrities, I'm a four-day celebrity. Four-day. I'm the four-day celebrity uh, in that I'll be the guy that will text an A-list celebrity friend, and I'll get the text back four days later. Yeah. That's, a, that's fair, though. That's yeah, fair. Like, like um, something happened with Dave, and I texted him. I got the four-day reply. Uh, Trayvon Free, who won an Academy Award, mm -hmm. he had Joey Badass in that movie that he wrote. Now, now, and now Trey and I were friends for a very long time. I'm the guy that encouraged him to get into stand-up. I'm the guy that let him live in my house. I bought him tires for his car when he was broke. Uh, oh. I took him to go buy his first car. I didn't buy it. He bought it, but I took him because he didn't know the world. And when he was between bi-coastal and all that, mm -hmm. I, he was staying with me. Yeah. And he won an Academy Award, and I texted him, I'm so proud of you, man. This is great. Four days later, I got my reply. That's fucked up. So, so look, I'm the four day. Look, no matter how fucking tight we were, I'm the four day guy. You know I used to be the guy that Kanye West said he learned the most about being an artist from anybody. Wow. To I went to the guy that couldn't get him on text message. To I went to the guy where he was like on drink champs, like, I don't even like the way this nigga rap. Wow. Oh, yeah, he did say that shit, didn't he? Oh, like, what the fuck? 
How did I get to this point? You know, Russell, you know what? Here's the problem. Me, what happened? Everyone gets back to me in two days. Just like really? Well, there you go. Ah, see, yeah. he's doing he's, better than you. Yeah, he is. Well, he's he's an agent. He's a manager, so it's probably more potential there. <laughs> right. He's, he's like, like, you got a check for, for work. Me? Mine is more potential for asking. <laughs> you know, good. Kanye went from a Jan Sport backpack to a Gucci backpack. That's the problem. Yeah. And Jan Sports <laughs> were expensive back then too. I'm feeling myself because number one, Dave does text back right away. He'll do a heart, but he will text back. And my biggest text was when Don Cheeto he got nominated for an Emmy and I was like congratulations on your Emmy and he wrote back thank you I don't even know if he knows who I was because I got his number when we interviewed but he wrote back thank you with a heart face and I was like ah! a lot of these guys you meet them and you you I met a lot of people when I was a nobody so to speak you never nobody but you know at the time you know when the world world rankings of boxing um, right. <laughs> where's Raheem when you need him <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I, uh, you know, I met Don Cheadle in 1995 mm -hmm. when he was shooting Rebound in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really, I met him briefly, but I hung around with his brother Colin mm -hmm. the entire summer. And it's not like we would see Don and be like, oh, Don. I met maybe Don twice that summer and it wasn't like anything meaningful. And then a few months ago, I was having dinner and Don was sitting right beside me at dinner. We were at this, you know, I think it was Cedric the Entertainer's birthday or something. And uh, I go, hey, man, how's Colin? He goes, ah, yeah, yeah. You know, what's funny is he asked me if I see you around here all the time. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, I remember when I met you in Toronto. I go, you fucking remember that? Oh, wow. I was cool. like, wow. And like, so these are t things you think people aren't, I think a lot of these really A-level people are very, they, they may be a little flighty by appearance because I think that's what they want you to think. Mm -hmm. I think they do that so to keep people away from them. Mm -hmm. But they are really taking in all the information at all times. So Mike yeah. Tyson came to my house in 2012 the first time. Uh, I had lent Eric B. my Bentley. <laughs> this, this all sounds ridiculous. Wow. No, it, sounds, it sounds right up your alley. Right. Wow. So Eric B. was in town and said, yo, Russ. I go, Eric, take my Bentley. So I gave Eric my Bentley. And he's like, yo, Russ, I'm coming. I'm bringing the car back. I got the caveman with me. I didn't know what he meant when he said they had the caveman with him. He pulls up in my driveway, and I go, is that fucking Mike Tyson in my car? And I'm like, yo, Mike wow. Tyson's at my house. If you ever me. lent me your Bentley, yeah. the first thing I would do is go get Mike Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, what part of Brooklyn are you from? Flatbush. Oh, yeah, you're not, you're not even Jamaican. Not even that's <laughs> so Mike comes to my house, and when I was hanging around, this is a good tie-in, mm -hmm. when I was hanging around Dave when he was shooting Half Baked, mm -hmm. I went out hang on his trailer. This dude that was in the movie... From Brooklyn, named Ray Hinton, mm -hmm. was hanging out. He would Ray David put him in the movie. Yeah, he told me how he grew up in Brooklyn. He grew up and he grew up with Mike Tyson. He knew Mike Tyson since he was a little kid and his sisters and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. Like if I ever meet Mike Tyson, I'm gonna ask him about Ray Hinton right. because I grew up with Lennox Lewis. Lennox Lewis and I have known each other since we were 15 years and you old. You know he was on my album on Ruckus. That's right. He did. He, he did. Uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This I, is Lennox Lewis. That's right. I remember that clearly <laughs> uh, because Lennox he, and I were amateurs together. Uh, and boxing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I've known him my, uh, basically my whole life. He was at my wedding everything. And anyway, so- I just partied with him this summer at Rohan Marley's house. Oh, yeah. friends with Ro Marley. Yeah, yeah. So cut to 2012, Mike Tyson's in my house. And I'm like, um, massage it in. I go, Mike, you, you know a guy named Ray Hinton? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He died. I go, what? He goes, yeah, he died of AIDS. Whoa. I go, what? He goes, crazy. Because me and him used to fuck the same chick at the same time. And, and she died of AIDS. And he died of AIDS. And I got nothing. And I was like, wow. Wow, right? Magic Junior. This is the first time I'm meeting Mike, right? And I'm thinking, <laughs> and I'm, thinking I'm probably never going to see Mike Tyson again. Uh -huh. And if I do, he's not going to remember me. Mm -hmm. Cut to me and Mike become good friends. Mm -hmm. And I was with Mike last year and out of nowhere, because uh, we're talking about Brooklyn and I'm talking about like gangsters that I knew from, you know, from Fort Greene. You know, remember rap? Do you know rap? Yeah. Do you remember OG rap? Yeah. I mean, so, I've heard yeah. stories. So rap, we used to run with the Real 50, but rap- From Fort Greene, the Real yeah. 50 Cent. Yeah. So rap, when rap got out of jail, rap did 33 years. When rap got out of jail, him and I became like this. Mm. I don't know why- we just clicked. So I was talking about rap with uh, Mike. 
I go, remember rap? He goes, oh, yeah, man. Hey, brother, man, you, know, we, you shouldn't be around these fucking people. You know, these are, these are killers, you know. They're going to ask you for something, then they're going to fucking kill you, man. You got you you ain't the, you ain't the same kind of, you know, you, you call me the N-word all day. You know, you ain't the same kind of motherfucker as me. So, you know, you got to be careful with you. And I go, nah, nah, Mike, it's all good. You know, blah, blah. And he goes, and then he, Chuck Zito was with us. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to Chuck Zito, uh, the former president of New York City Hells Angels. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you know, a guy who did his work, yeah, put in work. Um, and uh, so he, go, he looks at him and looks at Chuck. He goes, Chuck, you know, the first time I meet this motherfucker, he asked me about Ray Hinton. And I was like, wow. So he remembered. How the fuck do you cling on it? Like, I, that's wild to me because right. it's not like I'm nobody. He's Mike Tyson. He meets 150 people a day of note. And to remember that fucking detail, I'm like, wow. It wasn't like he asked me about some guy I knew. He, like, the, so people don't think people aren't paying attention. The people are in the position they're in because they're fucking retaining everything. Yeah, it's what they choose to react to. What? I was just talking to radio about Mike Tyson and what he means to the culture, and you know, he was just on Drink Champs again, and he said, uh, "I don't want to be great. I've met a lot of great people, but they're not good people." Yes, I love seeing Mike Tyson's evolution. Mike, listen, I, I don't even think it's an evolution. I think it's a it's a unpeeling. Yeah. Because Mike has always been that guy, and yeah. I recognize that with him when I would hear him talk in interviews, and it would always get, it would always get uh, framed in a way that they wanted it to be, but not the way he was actually saying it. Yeah, and, yeah. You man. know, people. I think people misunderstand Mike's low voice and his lisp mm-hmm. for being dumb, and he's yeah. he's the furthest fucking thing from dumb you'll ever meet in your life. Yeah, yes, the man indeed. is a savant when it comes to memory. I'm telling you, the guy. I'm a boxing fanatic. Mm-hmm. I'm a boxing nerd. That's why Radio Raheem and I can talk. Mm-hmm. And Mike was at my house. I had this poster of a Jack John because Jack Johnson was my favorite fighter. It's Ra- Radio Raheem's favorite fighter. Yeah, see, look at that. And I had this fight poster of Jack Johnson fighting some French guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mike sees the poster and he goes, oh, that guy was a spy. I go, what? The French guy, he was a spy for the French government. Mm. But he was a fighter too, but he was a spy. Mm. I was like, like, I didn't know this shit. And then I Google it. Goddamn right, he Mike was. knew. Mike knows fucking uh, it's a, the guy. The guy's really intensely smart, and I think that's why he gets misunderstood. Because I think the smarter you are, the more misunderstood you're going to get. Yeah. Look at yeah. Dave. So anyway, so red, white, and brown. In red, white, two thousand and eight. Yes. <laughs> in that special, you say one of my favorite things. You say that the Arab extremists seen on Western television are the rednecks of the Arab world. Right. Vanilla ISIS, Al Qaeda. <laughs> so, can you break down what you meant by that? So, when they show us um, Middle Eastern Middle Eastern people or any other part of the world for that matter in America, mm-hmm. they only show you their bad apples, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And that's how they want. It's about perception. It's about propaganda, and that's what they promote to us to make us feel better about ourselves. Look at how much, look at how savage they are and look at how great we are. And what they don't realize, it's happening conversely to everywhere around the world. Yeah. So you got to think America is doing this with everybody else, but everybody else is doing this with America. Mm -hmm. So you're doing this against this, but this is going to fucking win because this ultimately wins. Um, So when they, when they show Americans, they don't, you know, I saw a French comedian. Somebody sent me this clip of a French comedian the other day. And he was talking about, uh, uh, I don't want to butcher this, but he was like, the, in America, they told these kids, they did an experiment. Uh, you can have this one marshmallow. And if you don't eat it in 15 minutes, you can have a second marshmallow. Hmm. And 73% of these Americans not only ate the marshmallow, but they shot everybody in the room and stole all the marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I butchered it, but that's the gist of it. You know what I mean? Um, it's fucking brilliant because that's how it's the brilliant. that's how the rest of the world sees America. Yeah. You shoot your problems, mm. and you know, oh, our guns, our guns, and NRA, and uh, how dare you take our guns? That's our culture. Our guns are our culture. Yeah, like that. You have no culture to the point where you fucking put it on a piece of steel, mm-hmm. and. and there's no, there's no telling them there's wrong. Like mm-hmm. you're, you're a anti-American if you say something about that is wrong. Mm-hmm. We are more interested in getting women's rights taken away from them about abortion, but they can kill as many fucking babies as they want with a gun. That's mm-hmm. right. So you can't vacuum them out, but you can shoot them out. So that's right. There's the good news, guys. We care about life until it's here. Yes, 
And even then, they don't give a fuck. Right. Tell her, I know you skipped 14, but can we go back so I can ask this other question? Yes, you can, Jasmine Lee. You're not West Indian? My family is, but I'm not. Where are they from? Like, Jamaica, but it's not. How the not, fuck are you going to deny your Jamaica? I'm not denying it, but it's like I was raised around hey, it, yeah, but I'm not. Yeah, I want to fuck around you. Yeah. <laughs> suck yourself, you pussy all your <laughs> See, we have Brooklyn people in the house. <laughs> He's not Jamaican. I performed at Nagasaki's back in the day. Nagasaki's? Yes, right ab- right below Jamrock. I wanted to go there. My mom used to go there all the time. Hell yeah, your mom's Jamaican. And we, and I remember she when I finally. She would go there and bubble. <laughs> when I was... She would bogle in a dance and bogle in a party. No, bubble. She would bubble. She would bubble in Bridgens. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. I remember when I was finally old enough to go. And it was, I mean, it wasn't as good as I thought I it was going to be. I can't believe you're Jamaican and you're not talking about it. I'm not Jamaican. It. My family is Jamaican. I was raised Jamaican, but I am not Jamaican. Listen, that sounds you, you like know what you're, you're Jamaican, but you're Jamaican. Well, you know I was what, raised let, it, but... You have to wait. I'm, my must, family's Jamaican. I was raised you Jamaican, must wait, but, but I'm not Jamaican. You're not born in Jamaica. You're you not Jamaican. You have to wait. Madam, please wait. Jamaican. That's like me going... I'm not Indian. Motherfucker, I'm Indian. But I'm not. It's it's complicated. So it yes, I'll just say yes. Let's, let's just you know say what yes. it is? You don't know how to fucking make oxtail. What? Um, <laughs> Oh, you see, now you feel tough now you feel insulted. Yes, I do. She's also a chef. Don't, don't. So she was more insulted that you insulted her cooking <laughs> than you were that you insulted her heritage. Admit it. You're, My oxtails is bomb. Don't even play. Brown stew chicken ain't brown even that brown. Brown stew chicken is the best thing that I make. Stop it right now. I want to yam your food, and listen, I don't mean that in a sexual way. Don't listen. Brown stew chicken is is is. But can I go back? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Rice and peas. Rice gungu, and peas. Gungu peas or. Google peas. She's not Jamaican. What the heck are Google peas? Google peas. Gunga. Gunga peas. Oh, I think it's like a pigeon pea, right? Yeah. All right. I I said from the age of four, I thought I was Jamaican. No, he's really from Toronto, right there. That's what that was. Filled with Jamaicans. Yeah, that's what that was. I have a lot of family in Toronto. See. Uh, okay, so you were the first comedian to get a Netflix special, Notorious. Correct. I was probably the first comedian to never get another one. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Amazon Prime. Yeah, or well, never, not them either. Okay, well, shout out, shout to, out to Independence, baby. Bandcamp. <laughs> so, okay, I have two questions because obviously Netflix has gone crazy with the specials now. So the first thing is, um, are they special if everyone has one? And also, what do you think about the comedians that are taking these Netflix specials that they are not yet ready for, but they are just taking them for the check? Okay, so are they special? It depends on who they are. Uh, Damon Wayans said this uh, recently. Just because you're special doesn't mean that is special. Yeah. He was talking about Dave. Yes. Yes. I don't, you know, I don't want to He was showing him. Dave respect. He was showing Dave. Dave yeah. is very special. He was there. showing I, Dave respect. But, but again, was... I don't know what he was referring to. So uh, no no slight to my brother Dave. Um, and and would you really slight somebody for wanting to do a special? Listen, I, there was times where I wasn't ready in my career, um, early in my career to do stuff. But money was there. Mm-hmm. And I, I figured, you know what, this is an opportunity. Maybe this is the opportunity. You can't snub the opportunity when it shows itself. Do you th- really think? Do you really think Netflix is going to be like, "Oh, that's cool. I respect you." They don't fucking respect you. They don't respect me. Right. I fucking mm-hmm. started their division. You think these cocksuckers give a shit about me? They'll cut me out of everything. My first special that was on Netflix, it's gone. You see it there? If you tell me, if you see it there, let me know. It's not I'm there. Pretty I sure, looked. Oh, yeah, it, I did, I'm pretty sure everything there. that I have. That's on notorious. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. And notorious was the one. I'm pretty sure everything that I that I am in on that network net, Netflix will will be eventually eradicated and I will not exist on the network at all anymore. And that's fine. That's just the way the game is played. But will they act like they're your friends when they see you? Do you sure as fuck that phony fucking LA shit? They will do it. I I see it both ways because I started comedy in LA, but I already had a lot of friends in comedy before I started. But how long have you been doing it now? Uh 7 years. So I met you like right as you started. Right as I started. I got a lot of opportunities early on that I feel like I wasn't necessarily ready for. Now, the Comedy Central Roast Battle, would I go back and turn that down? No, I would do it again, even though I I did it my first year. I saw you at Roast Battle in the belly room before. Oh, yeah. I was there. Yes. But there are some shows around town, like, for instance, Bob Sumner's show that he had on Tuesday. Bob it Sumner was had the comedy the store room. on Tuesdays back yes. in the day. I did that show, like, my first year of comedy. I bombed, and he never put me back up. If I would go back, I wouldn't do that show, because I got that show just because of connections, but I was nowhere ready 
for that stage. And I would have waited to get on that stage because. But that's because of hindsight. At the time, you did the right thing. Okay. You did mm. what you should do. And here's the thing for me. What was really tough for me was I, I like I dominated the black circuit in Canada in the mid 90s, like from 95. Like that's where my following came from. I was popular in the black community before I was popular in the Indian community. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yo, I got this. And then when I went to New York and I went to do shows in these black rooms, I ate a fat dick that night <laughs> because I didn't realize that they weren't West Indians. They were not immigrant black people. Mm. And Which I was, we had in New York, but those, yeah, that's but, what, so, who, who didn't show up at your show. Right. right. When I went to Nagasaki's, I killed. When I did the Bronx <laughs> BBQ, I got booed the fuck off stage. African Americans. Oh yeah, yeah, and and, and hood. My, pe my people. Hood, hood, not just like just the hood. Right, like, hood, hood. Like, yeah, like, like I literally got called a pretty motherfucker. You lean into and make fun of and play with and have fun with stereotypes. Yes. And you ha talk about the different communities that you grew up in, and everything. Um, you didn't realize until you say in your stand up, and I don't know how true this is. Let me tell you this. Mm -hmm. My stand-up is all true. Okay, well, then I'll assume it's true. You say you didn't realize until going to India that a lot of your punchlines are the Indian accent. Has anyone approached you angrily about saying the N-word or about using Indian accents or about making fun of Chinese people at all? Have you got any angry... You know, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. So when I do it, whenever I talk about Indian, Chinese, black, whatever, mm -hmm. I'm doing it from a place that's real. Mm -hmm. So when I do my Chinese quote unquote impression Chinese people immediately know what I'm doing mm -hmm. I'll be in mainland China mm -hmm. or I'll be in Malaysia or Singapore and they'll be like we love the joke you did with the Hong, with the Hong Kong accent they don't even say Chinese accent mm. they all immediately know exactly which accent I just did uh. and the same thing with Indian people the funny thing for me is India they're like oh, that, Russell, that was great so they make the fun of the accent so funny and I'm like you know you just have that accent, right? And I'm like, come on, don't be stupid. That's the same thing. I don't have an accent. I'm, and I'm like, and I'm like, I, I'm thinking I'm on candid camera because I'm like, uh, is there a camera on me? Because this motherfucker be sounds the same. But you know, I mean, I get it. They understand that the level of the accent that I'm doing is a certain region. Like when mm. I do it, it, it's very specific. There's never any broad strokes in what I'm doing. I'm not doing it to mock them. Mm. I'm doing it to quote them. Mm. So if I'm talking about the Chinese guy, it happened in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. He had that accent, and people recognize that that's they that's why they know the story's true. Right. So when I even when I just said the N word now, you know that these motherfuckers yelled this at me mm -hmm. at the in at the Bronx barbecue at 1:30 in the morning in 1996. <laughs> you know that that's exactly what happened because you could tell by the tone of what they're saying. It's not just saying it for the sake of saying it. You're not doing it for the sake of doing it. You're bringing me back to Dave New York, Russian Dave. Yeah. Russian Jewish white boy Dave New Russian York. Jewish white boy Dave who had the fucking Rough Rider jackets That's on. That's right. Rough Riders Motorcycle Club and you know there was times we had conversations and he would do the same thing and he would quote because he was around black people all the time. My, same. And he would be like, you know, this guy said to me this, and he would say it. I'm like, Dave, you can't say that, bro. And he's like, yeah, I know, but we're just in the car. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm just preparing you for when we're not in the car. Yeah, well, no, that's the <laughs> well, thing. That you got it. Great thing to do. Well, no, you also know. Dave I, wasn't I, a comedian as well. But, no, you know, Dave but, wasn't a comedian. Dave was a great guy. Great guy. Uh, you know what? You know how I met Dave? Was at Dilla's funeral. Yeah, man. Wow. That's how I met Dave. Wow. He was Dilla's right-hand man. Yeah, I met him at Dilla's house because I had just moved to L.A. in January. Dilla died like three weeks later, and Dilla and Common were roommates. That's right. And Frank Nitty, mm -hmm. who I've known for 20-something years from Detroit, who grew up with Dilla, Frank Nitty was like, yo, Russ, can you take me to Dilla's? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll take you to Dilla's. I, I had a car, and he didn't have a mm -hmm. car. So I was just hanging out, and I'm watching everybody in the room, and I'm like, I didn't know Dilla. I, I mean, I knew Dilla, but mm -hmm. I didn't know. I never met Dilla. And now, do I know Miss Yancey? Hell yeah, I know Miss Yancey. Do I know his she little... She was in Puerto Rico with yeah. us. Yeah, do I know his little brother, John? I know John, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But did I know John John DeWitt Yancey? I did not know John DeWitt Yancey. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I was fortunate enough to get in with the family, and, and I'm honored to have them mention me in his book. Yeah. Which is wild to me because I'm a fan, but I never met the guy. You host Roast Battle Canada. That's correct. Can I'm one you, of. I'm one of. Yes, you have a couple hosts. First of all, I 
I couldn't find a free episode to watch. Word? I was looking, but I did love your um, the commercials, um, the promotion for it. It really made me want to get on stage and roast battle. But um, <laughs> can you take us um, through the beauty and the art of roasting and so, why you love it so much? Here's the thing. Now, as you know, because you've done roast battle at the Belly Room. And also on Comedy Central. And on Comedy Central. But being around the roast battle at the Belly Room from the from its inception... So I've been around it for so long, and I love roasts because I love mean, fucking true, mm-hmm. gritty comedy. Because, you know, I grew up with snapping. We right. snapped on each other. Right. And, you know, when you're the Indian guy around a bunch of black dudes, you don't think I'm hearing every fucking Slurpee and 7-Eleven joke in my <laughs> teens? Mm-hmm. you kidding me? And I, I had to get good at it immediately. I had to go with big lip jokes because they were going big nose jokes. And then they were doing dad works at 7 Eleven. I was like, you didn't know your dad, you know, all that kind of stuff. So for me, it was like, how mean can people get? Because mm-hmm. this is great. And Roast Battle in the Belly Room is the meanest, Evil. funniest motherfucking yep. place you'll ever be. Love Roast it. Battle Canada is like the sound of music to me. <laughs> I was wondering, like, is Canada supposed to be the nicest come alive yeah, because with like the sound of roasting? Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, I love that, the, I love that we're trying. Right. And I love being on the show, and I, I, but I think we need to go harder. And their idea of being mean is like, uh, your outfit is really, and I'm like, ah, come on, motherfucker, try. Because mm-hmm. I'm mean. I have a mean, mean side to me. Yeah, me too. And that's why I try not to joke around with people um, regularly because... Yeah, you can't do that with civilians. Yeah, because it's civilians. like, I'm going to let you mm. ride, but when I come for you, you're going to be crying, and now I'm a bitch. Yeah, but, well, when um, some guy came for you, you had a baby. Now listen. Oh, my um, God! <laughs> and see, that's how it starts. <laughs> that's how the roasting starts. But he's the only one with the mom bod. Uh, <laughs> come on, Jazz, we want you to win. No, I was saying you had the mom bod, not me. Because you said I someone came at me, I had a baby, and I said you're the one with the mom bod. It's all right. I have a no, I have a fucking fifty two year old dad bod. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. I'm an Indian guy. We weren't supposed to be genetically gifted. Listen, I'm, but- <laughs> <laughs> I'm already losing this battle from the start. <laughs> but no, I, I did think that it was very kind of cutesy nice, but it's like kind of hard to bring the belly room onto TV because no, what the, goes on in the belly room, you really cannot say. No, but here's the thing. I, I when I, when I signed on for the show, when they asked me to do it, I was like, are they going to be mean? Yes. That's what we want them to do. I go like no holds barred, like no holds barred. I go, fuck, I'm in then. But they and, had no and, metric. And, and, no, but yeah, it's the thing. Yeah. When you convert it to metric, it's not as good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, a so mile that was, is a that mile, was quick. but 1.6 kilometers seems longer. Right. <laughs> and, you know, my, my ex-girlfriend broke up with me because she said I was un-American. I, I should have seen that coming from a kilometer away. <laughs> I, uh... now, now, you now you described yourself as, as mean. Um, you, in a lot of your specials, immediately, I feel like you, you get comfortable by going in on the audience. It's yeah. like you come out on stage... You pick a couple of targets. You see them out there. You're like, okay, I'm going to go in and on just to give myself a, like a, a level of comfortability. Um, and you really did that really well in Almost Famous. Oh, yeah. Um, when the person said they were a gen- general surgeon and you mistaked it for genital. And right. then you said, <laughs> I'm cutting into your business. He's cutting into your business with a gynecologist. Right. That was so fucking quick. That, see, that now that goes back to me loving MC battles. Okay. I love MC Battles. And I know you did that world before you got yeah. signed. And that's what made you who you are. Mm-hmm. And then once you got signed, you were like, all right, well, I know that these freestyle guys don't know how to make a record. I got to make so a record. I got to go make a record. Yeah. Like, I love Chino XL. Mm-hmm. Shout I, out to Chino XL. I, who, I was on the phone. Steve asked me to book Chino XL. And I was on the phone with him. And we had such a great conversation. We're going to have him on the show. I so. love Chino XL. Mm-hmm. Chino XL is so fucking dope lyrically. Mm-hmm. Um newsworthy Mm -hmm. he's always current his shit is always on point and but does does the average person know about Chino XL no unfortunately no except through Tupac records right Right, when Tupac with with his brilliant diss fuck you too Chino XL right which is that's a bar right if you get dissed by Tupac when he was mad at everybody I mean he dissed Nas Mob Deep Jay Z and Chino XL that's quite a list to be a part of you're you're in good company there but Chino's dope 
and I've always been a fan since day one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so I would listen to guys like Juice, Battle Super Nat, and all oh, that kind Super of Oh, Super Nat, who we also Nat. had on this show. Right. Rico Price. Rico Price. You know his real name. I'm See, you, sorry. That's we why both, I fuck with you, Russell we Peters. Both, we both RPs. Okay, that's why I fuck with you, because you know your shit. <laughs> Not too many people know Supernatural's real name. Well, did you know Chino's last name is Barbosa? Now listen. I did uh, know that. <laughs> And he's from East Orange, New Jersey. Yeah, Chino's yeah. dope, though. So fucking dope. Like, but Chino always said those punchlines that made me go, God damn, that's fucked up, but so good. It's so good. You know, the best MCs always float to the top, mm -hmm. unlike the son of John F. Kennedy. I was Whoa. Like, Yo, that Whoa. shit is fucking <laughs> Whoa. dope. That's dark. Oh, my God. Love, he always said some ill shit like that. And, do, you, and, do you follow the current battle rap? I don't. And I'll tell you why, because it's fucking written now. It is written. And I don't like that. And King of the Dot is a real thing. No, if, I know. And like, I, from Toronto was very prominent in the battle rap scene. I know, but I don't like the pre-written shit. That, okay. The, to me, the whole thing about it was freestyle. Okay. When I saw, like, when when Juice battled Supernat and he said, uh, All off the top. I'm going to rip off this motherfucking picture. And I was like, yo, that shit is dope because it's, like, happening. Did you see the when Supernat came back and battled Juice and he came out to the Simon Says... Bam, 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 bam. Yeah, he came out. Yeah, that's one. That's, that's when he the battle. That's, that's the one. Okay, yeah, that's the, the okay, that's the, yeah, that's the poster one. And then uh, Juice came in with was it Juice who came in with the uh, uh, you're not prepared to battle your understudy or some shit like that. You know the guy because somebody was doing the Biggie impressions. Nat, Nat, and yeah. then Juice came in with that, and then I was like oh, Rico shit. Price for everybody else. Yeah, and then. <laughs> I was like, there's no way we could come back from this. And Super Nat fucking destroyed him. Super Nat is one of my best friends. And um, and he's from Chicago. No, Super Nat's from, he's from Indiana. In, right? Next door to Chicago. Well, yeah. Craig G, Super Nat's going to be so mad when he sees this episode. But Craig G, when he battled Super Nat and won, Super Nat was blindsided. And I just ran into Craig G last week. That's why I remember this. Yep, Craig's my man. And Craig said, Craig Curry. When you go back to Indiana, <laughs> get Mike Tyson out the slammer. Because Mike Tyson was locked yeah, up in yeah, jail at right. that time. Yeah. yeah. And that line right there, the crowd lost their shit. Yeah. You know. Craig's highly underrated, too. So because you do so much crowd work, you don't ever write. Nope. You do everything off the dome. It's off right the dome there. or it ain't happening. I could tell when I watch the specials. But I could tell like when, you, when, you, when you're going in and the guy looks like the... Uh, the sperm. And it's like, I could tell. I'm like, okay, you just, you walk on stage and you peep where they at. And right. then you keep their names in, in your mind. Right. So you could do callbacks later on. My favorite thing, because I used to box. So everything is like boxing to mm -hmm. me. So, all right. I know that if I'm throwing this jab, he's going to know I'm timing. He's going to start timing my jab eventually. And comedy is timing. He's going to start timing my jab. All right. So I'm going to stop throwing the jab. I'm going to throw a hook. Just throw him off a little bit. And then I'm going to fake a hook and throw a right hand. You know, whatever the deal is, you got to keep them off their feet. So if I ask you, Jasmine, I ask you your name early in the show, and I don't talk to you again for 20 minutes, you're going to think he forgot. Then I'll, Bob, I'll be looking here and I'll be blah, blah, blah. Jasmine, I got to ask you a question. Yeah. And, pe and then you get caught. You're like, what the fuck? How, what? And everybody starts laughing immediately because like, how did he remember her name? And why did that just happen just now? Yeah. And then they want to know what's going to happen. So that's the way I do it. It's, it's all about the punch you don't see coming. Yeah. Right. That's, that's brilliant. Um, Just Blaze was in the audience for that? No. I think I, th I thought I heard you shout out Just Blaze at the end. Uh, my, no, you know, my buddy Justin was there. Okay, so you probably called him. So Justin, he used to call himself Just Blaze. That's what it was. I was and like, what is Just Blaze doing <laughs> sitting in all the But I do know <laughs> Just Blaze as well. Right, who but, also has a show on Up Rocks about sneakers. Here's the thing about my buddy Justin, who, I co who used to be called Just Blaze. Mm -hmm. Justin is Busta's first cousin. Jamaican connection. Yeah, well, so Busta's dad and Justin's dad are brothers. Right. Oh. Okay. And Buster's real name, Trevor. Not, not his God body name. Trevor. Trevor. Trevor which Smith. is a real Jamaican name. Right. And his family calls him TJ. TJ. That's right. Because he's Trevor Jr. That's right. Which is wow. extra Jamaican. All right. Now here's one to fuck with Pete Rock. Don't get mad at me. So if everybody knows Pete Rock is Peter Phillips. Yes. When Heavy D was alive, Heavy D was Pete's cousin. That's right. Hev was at my house. And he's like, you know what? Uh, I was like, yo, your name is Dwight Arrington Myers. How fucking Jamaican are you, Jeff? <laughs> Hev? And he's Harrington. like, you think I'm Jamaican? You know what Pete Rock's middle name is? I go, what? He goes, Ogilvy. I'm like, <laughs> God damn! <laughs> <laughs> He's Peter Ogilvy Phillips, and Dwight was Dwight Arrington Myers. I was like, they were the most Jamaican family in For Mount sure. Vernon. So, look, 
He had records with Super Cat. He had now, Big and Ready. Pete, don't get mad at me. Get mad at Funk Flex. All right, Continue. I was about to get to that. I'm getting to that. <laughs> now, 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 Heavy D, I was going to get to that, but we got to, you mentioned Heavy D, right? right? And Heavy D, Big and Ready and records with Super Cat and, and Delilah. Mm. The, his, his reggae records, to me, as good as his hip-hop records were, right. his reggae records were, were where he found his true self. Right, so when I was, so, uh, and now here's a, here's a, 87. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I go to this concert in Toronto. It's uh, Salt and Pepper opening, Heavy D metal, and MC Sham was headlining. Mm -hmm. That's where he found snow. It might be. It might be. I don't think <laughs> right. it was. It wasn't. It was not actually. But and Fama. Salt, <laughs> Salt and Pepper came out. They only had at the at the time. I only knew them for Tramp. Mm -hmm. What you call me? Yeah. And Salt and Pepper came out and fucking ripped it. I was like, holy shit, they're dope. And then Have only had Mr. Big stuff out mm -hmm. at that time. And then he was like. Oh, he did Mr. Big Stuff, and then he started speaking Jamaican, and the fucking crowd went nuts. Right. I went nuts. And he goes, here's a new record I'm working on. Here's a new song, blah, blah, blah. And he played Overweight Lovers in the House. And I remember, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. I remember being 16, 17 years old, fucking bouncing up and down, like, yo, this shit is That shit's a crazy dope. record. Because it's, and to see them with, they had the big NPC set up, and they were like, ba 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 boom. It's because the record wasn't pressed yet. Right. Da 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 and da 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 da. And I was like, da, 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 da. man, that's good. I was like, right. yeah, this shit is fucking big, dope. Big man dancing like that. Yeah, and he was fucking killing it with the moves. Yeah. And then he and then he was speaking Jamaican. I was like, this guy's the fucking king of the world. And then Shan came out and had a white guy drumming for him. That was Snow. No, 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 no. <laughs> no he hadn't met Snow yet. This is 87. <laughs> Snow didn't come out till like 92, 93. I'm just going to hold Shan responsible for Snow the whole time. I love Shan. Shan's my Me man. Me too. Shout out to Shan. But Shan came out with a drummer, a white guy, and he came out with TJ Swan. And I was like, uh, this you is. You all know TJ Swan. He sang on my records. Oh, yeah. Made the music, nobody beats a bid. Well, check it. TJ Swan is the original Nate Dog. That's, that's that's right. And Nate Dog is the original Acorn. That part of the record, nobody beats the biz, no. nobody beats the biz. Yeah. That was the yeah. part. Make the music. Yeah. Yeah. So TJ Swan and Shan came out and then and they had some white guy drumming. And I was like, it was like a rock guy. He had long hair and everything. It was 87, you know? Mm. And he's like, and I'm like, what the fuck is that white boy doing on the stage? And I'm like, <laughs> I was so mad that I saw a white guy at a hip hop show. Mm -hmm. Not in the audience, but on stage. I'm like, fuck this guy. He doesn't know about this music. He had long hair. It was like, you tell me he's a real drummer. And he wanted to rock out. And I'm like, ah. But Shan lost me that night. But Shan and I subsequently became friends. And, uh, you know, and Shan's voice sounds exactly the same to this day right. as it did in 1986. I follow him on Instagram. I see what he be talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're a facts over beliefs guy. Yes. And so am I. Really? Yes, I, I always thought you were one of them. They're Muslims. I'm not. It's just the name. <laughs> oh, yeah. But um, a lot, a lot of my friends are Muslim. As a matter of fact, most of my friends are Muslim, right. and my closest friends are Muslim, and I have a Muslim name. But yeah. I'm not a religious guy. How did you get this name? My parents. Uh, in the '70s, everybody had African name books. Right. But my parents, just like Amir Thompson's parents and right. Tariq Trotter's parents, correct. The, and the, but Philly was like mad Muslim. Mad Muslim, but these guys weren't necessarily raised Muslim. Right. Our parents didn't parse the difference. They just got those African name books, and right. they didn't understand some are from the uh, Arab Arab world, and some are from the more you know African world. And so we, a lot of black kids from the born in the seventies in the East Coast, have Muslim names: oh, Jamal, Rashad, Tariq, Rashad, Rashad, Rashad all yeah. that. And so that's that's where I'm from. But you have confirmed in your comedy, correct, that the Earth is round. Correct. I didn't think we needed to do this again. Right. But for the sake of some people in my audience who might be, who are these fucking weird flat earthers <laughs> you got in your fucking? And I'm just saying, I show? might have some flat earthers watching the show. That is insane. So just for have the you sake, there's been an, uh, an uprise in flat earthers since YouTube University started. Oh, YouTube okay. University Where is a real thing. Flat earthers, you can get a degree from there. Pre yeah. pre fucking internet. Where were you flat earthers then? Because it, it's the they've been easier to prove before the internet. It's the algorithm, right? Because the algorithm gives you what you want to see. Right. So if you're somebody who's like, yo, I think the Earth might be flat. You know what? Let me go on YouTube. And check, YouTube is going to decide based on capitalism right. that, you know what, we're going to feed you information that leads you to believe that you are correct. Yeah. See, now I'm, I'm very open to a lot of things. So I'll go watch people talk on YouTube and I will agree with a lot of their points. 
And then I'll see them say something that's way out of fucking, and I'm like, what, what, how'd you lose me, kid? Right. Yeah. You were doing so well with me, and then you had to go and say this dumb shit. We were I'm all like, rooting for you. You almost fucking fucked up your own game with me, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of guys out there who make really strong arguments for certain things, and then when they have an opinion about something else, you're like, are you fucked? How are you so right about this and so fucked up and wrong about that? That's the problem with online arguments and debates and YouTube Listen. is that you find yourself agreeing with people whose values and ethics do not align with yours. Again, uh, if if I was to boil myself down, I go, holy fuck, am I far right? You know, and then I hear them make one argument. I go, oh, no, I'm not. Thank you. And then I go, <laughs> then I go oh, I'm not far left either. I don't know where the fuck. I guess I'm in the middle because you're both fucking idiots. Right. Like, now you is, say, is it impossible to be in the middle? Can we not have a middle fucking ground in America anymore? Do you have to be an extremist on both sides? Well, I think it's about the paradox of tolerance. You know, and I think it's about... No, because one, it's, it's spite now. Everything mm -hmm. is done out of spite. I don't like this. Well, yeah, well, then we do. Oh. I don't spill drinks, but yes, I do. <laughs> you know what we'll I mean? We'll get like, somebody on that. Party file. Well, look at that. Now, from Deported, which is an incredible special, you say something that touched my heart and made me feel seen and heard. You said, you say whatever you want to us on the internet, and if we respond, we're the assholes. Right. Mm. I got canceled for this very thing. The idea that because I have a certain privilege, which I do, earned privilege as a celebrity. Right. Right. I have born privilege and then I have earned privilege. Right. I often respond to people as if I'm not a celebrity. I, I, I Listen, I follow you, so I see it oh, happen yeah, so, all the time. Yeah. And... I got to be honest with you, as a, as a friend and as a fan, mm -hmm. I admire it. Mm -hmm. I admire the way you blow people up. Mm -hmm. Because don't ever look at it as a case of, well, because I'm a celebrity, I shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. No, then you're being bullied. Yeah you, are, I, yeah. you are going against the bully. The only problem with it is, and I don't say this is your problem, but this is the only problem in general, mm -hmm. is that you're fighting with the invisible man. Okay. We don't know who this person is. That's right, because a These person- are random people that can create a profile and then go, go fucking private. And so you're arguing with- you're That's basically correct. basically yelling at yourself in the mirror. The person who canceled me, and my career has done nothing but become better since I got canceled. Right. Right, so cancel culture is not real in that aspect. I agree with you. But the person who canceled me, I don't even know if this is a real person. It could be a bot. Yeah, and this That's person right. did a bunch of interviews, but no one could tell me that they actually saw this person. Again- I have often said this in interviews. I said, have you ever met the person that is this upset? Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever met this person. So right. she doesn't have an Instagram either? She has an Instagram, but it's one picture. And her uh. Instagram is private. I can't access it. I've tried. Because I actually tried to sue this person. I really, Because I lost some wages behind this. I mean, Absolutely. you know, we all know at Uproxx, it was you a whole bunch of situations. Too, right? So I, I tried to find this person to sue them, and I couldn't find them. Because they don't exist. They don't, she didn't actually exist. It's a bot. Mm -hmm. You're fighting against the computer. Mm -hmm. This is literally the rage against the machine. This right. is what you're doing. Right. You know, this is it, we are getting suckered into it. And because they know that humans are susceptible to a certain degree, mm -hmm. and these computers have no emotions. These mm -hmm. are just like fucking, these are random people that in third world countries don't even know what the fuck they're typing. They're just like, that's right. what I was told to write. I'm just writing what I'm writing. That happened to me. I got into a thing where I'd, um, and not to get too political here, but- I had decided after taking a gig in Israel mm -hmm. to cancel my gig in Israel right. and show some uh, solidarity with BDS and Palestinians. And mm -hmm. Jared just shit himself. Not in the orange chair, Jared. And I started getting trolled by pro-Israeli forces and bots. It's and, all bullying. And one of them said to me, one of them was trolling me like it was every two minutes for like 48 hours. And I actually responded, I'm like, how is it possible that you have the time and energy to do this at every two minutes for 48 hours straight? He said, oh, it's not just me. There's are teams. He was like, he told me like, this is just my shift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not even personal. It's just like, yeah, we're going to go for you. Bam, yeah. bam, 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 bam. Now, um, somebody- I had a similar situation. Not, I never had anything publicly happen. But at one point in time, I had wanted to do, a, I, I wanted to do my, after I did Notorious, I wanted to do my next special as, I wanted to do Ramallah one night and Tel Aviv the next night mm -hmm. and tape them both and piece them together. Mm -hmm. And I have such a huge following in the Arab world mm -hmm. My Arab friends put me aside. They were on your ass. And no, they weren't even. They were like, listen, 
we know what you're trying to do. Mm. And we see what you're trying to do. And we think what you're trying to do is actually really great. But the fucking psychos, they're not going to appreciate it. And they will bring you down. This is, what, this is the same thing that happened to me. Yeah. Because I was fighting against it. Because I was like, look, I'm going to go to Israel. We're and then trying I'm to gonna, be reasonable. I'm going to go to Palestine. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm thinking as an artist, art bridges to cap. And people, there were Palestinians living in Israel. Damn. D-A-A-M. The Hold rapper. on a second. Those are, those are Palestinians in yes. Palestine. That's right. You, but <laughs> but you, you're right. You're, you're technically correct. But they told me, they said, listen, what you just said to me is like almost verbatim. Yeah. That's what they said to me. They said, we get what you're trying to do. Yeah. And we appreciate what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But the people that don't will fuck you over. Mm -hmm. They will fuck you up bad. Yeah. Because the crazy apparently is much stronger than the fucking sane. Now, someone who's not a bot, who's real, and I don't usually do this on this show. I don't usually call out critics by name. Mm -hmm. But I read this while I was researching in your interviews and stuff. I read this review by Sean McCarthy from Decider. He was upset about your special. Which one? It was deported. He was upset about deported. Sure. And what he wrote was, he talked about you going in on the, on the like, dealing with stereotypes. And he wrote, his fans love it, so he keeps doing it. But he wrote it as a critique. Yeah. I didn't read it as a critique. I read it as, duh. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, you know, your girlfriend says, your wife says, you know, I love when you go down on me. And then you do it. And like, your wife's going to be like, fuck you keep doing that for right or no it's like, like somebody know. else peeping in the window and saying hey i know your wife loves that but you should stop doing you should really it. try something different yeah <laughs> that's what Why? it was like because it's gonna make me get off <laughs> you know what i mean like you're, you're basically trying to make sure the fucking peeping tom come right fuck out of here dude <laughs> stop looking in my window fuck face. right me and my audience are good yeah and you built your career you it's like somebody going to you he really he, he makes a lot of conscious music mm -hmm. And the people that listen to him really like the conscious music. But what about the rest of us that want to hear about guns and shooting and baby <laughs> right. mamas? Right. He doesn't care about us. Right. A baby no. mama's not conscious? <laughs> I wish she wasn't. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Bravo, sir. Bravo. <laughs> I'm not bravoing that. You're probably a great... I am. You know what I mean? I, 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 I Honestly, and I mean this with, with, with love, I mean... I can't imagine you being an asshole baby mama. I can imagine me being an asshole, period. I can, be, I can imagine you being an asshole, but not an <laughs> asshole baby mama. Do you know what I mean? I think you're Thank an asshole because you. you're a comic. You're supposed to be an asshole. It's in my blood. But as far as the kid goes, you're going to be reasonable. Yes. Well, some women aren't built like that. After years of going after people, you finally get self-deprecating and deported. How did you go to that? Well, deported, I, I thought was more introspective mm -hmm. and a little bit more self-effacing almost. You mm -hmm. know, I, I wanted to really face myself in that mm -hmm. one. And uh, I'm not saying I didn't do that or did do that, but I don't think I hit it the way I wanted to hit it. Mm, oh. That's interesting. Um, but my new act that I'm doing right now. Is that Act Your Age? Act Your Age Tour is very much, I don't know if it's on brand, but it's on point with who I am as a mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I think in Deported, I was digging for pieces of my past that would connect with people that were already there. And now I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I got to get this shit off my chest now. Mm. It's for you now. It's for me now. And and I'll be honest with you, I've been getting the the 99% of the people that come to the show are like, that was the best I've seen you in a long time. Awesome. That's dope. It's dope so. to get older and keep getting better. Yeah, I mean, I'm That's only 33 comedy, years in, you know what I mean? So I'm new. <laughs> yeah. I'm new but, to the game. Yeah, man. And comedy is a profession that you literally do get better as you get older. Because like the rapping. more you experience or, or something life, else. <laughs> the more you have life experiences, the more people that you can relate to. Jeff Ross tells me all the time, you know, comedians don't make it until they're such and such in. But he says that because it's like, you have to get life experience in order for everyone to be able to find something funny. You're going to have your audience, but if you want everybody mm. to laugh at you, you have to do shit that people do. Jeff's another guy I've known for 26, 27 years. And He's I've such watched, a brilliant and comedian. And i watched Jeff get so fucking good now. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And for me, it's like, because you always, he was always such a likable guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, okay, okay. Oh, and then you see him and go, fucking fell into it he's he fell right into his own and i'll be honest with you i'm not saying this is the reason but i think it's a strong possibility that this could be a catalyst for it 
him being around Dave that much oh. really got him into his own. It helped Darnell, it helped Darnell get into his own and uh, helped a lot of guys get into their own. Mm. But but Jeff is right in the zone right now. I even texted him. I'm like, yo, he's you, killing it. The shit you're doing yeah. now, because Jeff and I have been on stage together and speed roasted people together, mm -hmm. and uh, I always enjoy that because I love doing that shit. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like, okay. Back then I was like, oh, we got this. And he's I, being like, more personable. He's not just roasting. It's he's talking about stuff that's happening in his life as well as having that freaking. Uh, no one can, people can't just speed roast. So he already has the speed roasting that's going to set him aside from everybody. But some roast comics can only roast. Like they oh, yeah. can't do stand up. So the fact it's that like now a freestyle rappers, so they can't make a record. Right. Yeah. Again, Naturally. you look at the batch of guys that are all in the top level right now. They're all 30 year veterans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's something to be said about that. Yeah. You know, I'm uh, Dave's 30. I'm 33 years in, which means Dave's got to be 34, five years in. Because Dave started a year or two before me. Mm -hmm. But Dave's also a year or two younger than me. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, 30-something, 30, 30. 30, 30, 30 you're veteran. Bill Burr, 30-something, you're veteran. All these guys, Sebastian, I think, is at like 25. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Joe Joe Coy is at 30-something years as well. Yeah. I mean, like everybody's hit their stride way later. I mean, I, I got, you know, I thought when I got popular in 2004 or 5, I was 15, 16 years in. I was like, man, this took forever. Right. And I look back and I go, wow, I got that shit too soon. Mm -hmm. That's that's some comedy shit. Like when we had Godfrey on here, he was like, he's Godfrey is another guy. He, he told fucking, Jasmine, he destroyed you were, it 30 something years. That was two years ago. He said, oh, you're a five year old because mm -hmm. you've only been doing it for five years. Yeah. Godfrey's amazing. And I didn't think that when we did the interview that I impacted him at all, but our conversations after that interview showed me differently. So I, 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 I you know, Godfrey had a, a, like an interesting, interesting career because his parents are Ni from Nigeria. He grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. In 96, when I was in New York at that time, um, I remember I already knew Godfrey at the time and we were good friends as well. Him and Mike Epps were roommates back then. Yeah, Did he remember. talk about that? And I remember being outside the the um, the cellar one night and I remember I was, I was wearing a suit. I don't know why. It was the 90s. You know what I mean? I was wearing a black suit. It was like a fly-ass suit. I think I was wearing a turtleneck with it or some corny shit. But, you know, it was the 90s. It was right. like the Jiggy era. Right. You were like and, an extra in Friends. No, no, nah, no, son. No, I was no, like no. an extra in a fucking Puffy no, no. video. Okay, you know okay, I mean? okay. Like, I, was, I was in that space. And uh, I remember Mike Epps hanging around with us that night and going, man, I'm going to quit this shit. This fucking business is terrible. I, I don't want, I want out. And I was like, and I remember looking at him going, I don't know, man. You never know when you're going to make it. And he made it a year later. Wow. Yeah. And he was like, well, look at you. You're doing them white boy shows just like that, motherfucker. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, you can say what you want to me. But I'm like, I, we were all nowhere at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then he did, I think, Blue Streak a year later or two years later with Martin. Right. And then his career just fucking took off from there. But him and Godfrey were roommates back then. Like, the, people don't know this. It's the same thing in the music industry. Like, you know, Ray Parker Jr. is a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He tells me these crazy fucking stories all the time. Man, I just watched this incredible documentary about oh, yeah, Ray on, Parker on who, Jr. On, uh, Amazon Prime? It's so good. It's so dope. I, but the funny thing is, I knew so many of those stories already. I didn't know any of them. You know, to me, I knew he was a... You know, I knew his history as a musician. I knew his history in Motown. I knew that he was an underrated musician who was seen as a one-hit wonder but had a lot more bubbling under. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know all the rest of that. He was a highly respected guitar player. Yeah. Highly respected. And he was part of the Love Unlimited Orchestra. Yeah. Um, here's an ill story that Ray told me. He was a session guy, right? Now, you're a music nerd, so you'll mm -hmm. understand this. Uh, he, was in set, he was in a session waiting, and Leon Hayward came in. Leon Hayward comes in and puts on the record for Smiling Faces. Mm. And he looks at the band and he goes, play this. He goes, what do you mean play this? He goes, learn this and play this. He goes, but like learn something like it? He goes, no, learn, motherfucker, learn this record <laughs> and play it. I'm going to go in the booth and sing some other shit. And they go, all right. He goes, it was easy enough. They all learned it. Mm -hmm. They start playing it. Leon Hayward goes in the booth. They're playing Smiling Faces. Leon Hayward goes in the booth and goes, I want to do, do something. something freaky to you. So that's Smile of it's Faces. the same fucking record. That makes a lot of sense. How fucking, man, when you go play those back yeah, to yeah. back, you're going to be like, I can't believe I didn't fucking catch. As a DJ, I got mad because I'm like, how did I not make this fucking connection? And then he said one time he was in the Even studio. the melodies are the same. Not the same. The, the same fucking up yeah. the chorus and the bridge. Everything is all in the same place. Oh, he was sampling. 
He was sampling before sampling. Yeah, and he then, was sampling arrangements and yeah, styles. It's, it's been happening before sampling existed. So then he talked I did that. I have a record on Rook. It's called Good To You, produced by Kanye. It's the first song I did by Kanye West with Kanye West. And my entire flow is Ether from Nas. Oh, yeah. And no one's picked that up. The shit that make you burn slow. Yeah, right, but right. It's, it's just Ether. I just took the raw pattern for Ether and wrote in that pattern. Yeah, that's a, that happened all the time back then. So he told me one time that Leon Hayward comes up to him in the studio and goes, I picked that up. He goes, you remember Ray had a song called For Those Who Like the Groove? It was an instrumental record and it had some really dope, funky bass lines in it. I used to roller skate to this record and it was like, bam, 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 bam. and the bass song was, boom, 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 bam, 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 so it was like this real, I, I loved it because I love funk too. Mm. So Ray tells me that Leon Hayward comes in the studio when he goes, hey, I'm taking that baseline shit you did in for those who like the group. Because he's like, <laughs> so Leon was kind of a bully with everybody. Right. He goes, I'm taking that baseline shit you did in for those who like the group and I'm taking some shit from the Gap Band too. And he goes, okay. He goes, whatever. He said the next day Leon Hayward comes in the studio and he plays him fucking Bad Mama Jamma. Wow. Bam, 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 wow. Bam, Give me a bitch. Bam, 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 bam. And then he takes burn rubber. Boom, 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 boom. And you're like, holy shit, how did I never piece this shit? It's like Leon together. Hayward was a DJ. Yeah, it was wild. Like when you hear it and you go, how the fuck? And when a woman needs love. When a woman needs love, mm -hmm. just like you do. He gave new edition, Mr. Telephone, Telephone Man. Man. That's right, because Ray He's Parker. Was writing all that early new edition shit. He did no, just that one song. Oh, that one song. Yeah, because Ray had done "When a Woman ah. Needs Love" and he had made it's Mr. Mr. Telephone, Telephone Man. Man. Okay, and then he recorded it and he didn't like it, and then he gave it to them. Ah. And it worked for them. And worked it's them. and and it's, but it's crazy. The same record. And you're right because it's like that record was written in the '70s, but new edition came out in the '80s. '84. But what helped them was they sounded like a group from the '70s. Right. Those songs were like this. Sounds like it was written back then. Right. Because it was. Do you know that group from Toronto, Bad, Bad, Not Good? Yes, they did an album with Ghostface. Good. Yeah, they did My Ghostface son, Amani Fela, is a, he's a huge fan. Right, yeah, they're dope. They're super dope. But then they did a remix of the song by um, Future Islands, mm -hmm. uh, that lead singer Sam Herring, who's a white, really fucking psycho-looking white boy from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. You know, he just kind of looks like he's got a receding hairline, he looks kind of kooky, and... But his voice, the first time I heard the Future Islands remix of this record, I thought it was a record from the 70s that I didn't know. And I'm like, how do I not know this record? Mm. And then when I found it, I go, this is from now? Mm. Yeah, Bad Bad Not Good is really good. Yeah, they're a trio. It's a great name for a band, too. Bad Bad. Um, I have another question about Deported before we move on. Um, in Outsourced, you say everybody, everyone will be beige because the world is mixing. I you said that in my Comedy Now special in 2003. Right, okay, that's the one I saw. I said in 20 years from now, the whole world will be beige. And you revisited- I was off by 10 years. Okay, well, you revisited this theory in Deported. Oh, did I? Yeah, just talking about how white people are scared of the future. Right. Um, this is replacement theory. This is what the Christchurch shooter was talking about. This is what the Balt Buffalo shooter was talking about. Right. We're seeing a backlash- in America in general, America's leading the charge when it comes to this thing. Correct. So being you're a brown person, you've addressed this in comedy, how does it feel to, to know that you were correct? I mean, for me, I, it, I don't look at it as being prophetic, but it really was. If you, if you look at things, there's a certain inevitability about life. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, you're going to die. Inevitably, you're going to pay taxes. Inevitably, we are going to fucking blend. You can build these fake walls and lines and, and put these rules up, but eventually people are going to mix. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're mixing is because we're all in, in, in everyone's circumference. Look, my son-in-law's Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. My stepdaughter's black and Filipina. Mm -hmm. Their kids will be, I don't know what the fuck they're going to be, but they're going to be <laughs> nail technicians. <laughs> <laughs> Where every group is going to be pissed off at this interview. That's well, right. That's, that's it's, the equal, it's equal opportunity it's pissing. Say more thing about whites. <laughs> Well, what, what more can you say about whites before they shoot up the studio? I mean. <laughs> well, we love you and appreciate you, and we're glad to have you as a guest. Wait, can I show. just say something about you? you? Can because say I don't feel people uh, give you the props you deserve. Oh, because you, to me, you're a young guy. Um, uh, even though you're, what, 47? Yeah, that's accurate. Wow. Wow. You're 47, 47. years old. But to me, in the hip-hop grand scheme of things, you're a new guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But you're to me, you're the last of the new guys who did hip-hop. Mm. 
You're the la- you're the literally the fucking last Mohican standing. Mm. Um, you were the last guy to come in and still do hip hop in its purest form and and recognizing the elements of hip hop. And now we got these kids coming out calling themselves so hip hop, but there's nothing fucking hip hop about them. Mm-hmm. And my debate isn't whether hip hop is good or not anymore. My debate is it was never meant for older people. And secondly, these young kids don't fucking care about history anymore. Mm-hmm. You're the last of the generation that gave a fuck about the roots of the tree. Mm. These kids are now focused on the leaves. They don't give a fuck mm. about it. You can chop down the tree as long as those leaves are there. Mm. So for a guy like me, who was very reluctant when your generation was coming out, 98, 97, high tech and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And the reason I fell in love with high tech was because you sampled Hill Street Blues. Did he rap Hill Street Blues? Or the, no, the actual the TV, TV show? show? I don't know if he did that. I don't it know was, if you would have you would have known you would have had to pay it, for that. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't on Ruckus at that time. It was on an independent label. And I remember the high tech label being written the same font That's as That's what he C- did with Kevin Lyles and him. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember yeah. I, and so when you came out and then everybody was like, and I remember going, fuck, this guy's fucking dope. And you and Mos, Dante. Yeah, Dante's the original name. Yes. Da- Dante Smith. Um, wow, it's Smith too. Um is he Jamaican? Uh, no, he is a uh, he's Dante pure American, American? Ma- pure <laughs> African American with Native American blood. Okay, like Melly Mel. Yes, yeah. I wanted to push back because we just interviewed Coast Contra, and they definitely care about the history, and they definitely are you familiar are doing with their them? homework, no. and they're definitely all about hip hop. And also, no, 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 I'm not saying all of them, but I think the I minute know. it left the East Coast, the history went out the window. Well, there you go. It's a um, controversial take, but I'll take it. Yeah. Coach Contra, you do need to know about them. It's, this, it's twins who are Razkaz and Teacher Moses twins. Oh, yeah, okay. These are Razkaz's kids. Yeah, and, and the, the two other guys. Raz, sorry, tell me about that. And there's, there's a Rio Los and Eric yeah, John Dumont. came to the house. Oh, he calls Razkaz by his government Everyone name. comes to his house. John. John. John came to the house. John Austin. John Austin came to the house. <laughs> or as they called him in high school, Raisin. Um, <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Dude. In Carson. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know too much about hip hop, bro. I know too much. I know way too fucking much. I know enough to get me killed. Listen, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's funny because I would always ask, I would ask or ask him like, "Yo, can I meet TJ?" Not in a corny way, but I'm a fan. I'm a fucking lover. Her first album was so dope. It was. She yeah. got a record cracking right now. Yeah, she really? does. Yeah. And uh, also, what's next for you? And Shit, what's one know. dream that you would like to accomplish before you are back on People's Party? Uh, I mean, mm. other than Disney, who wrote but, that question? That was Jasmine Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I have any dreams. My, I think my uh, after I think after a certain time in your life, you start to give up on not give up, but you you start to accept that things are going to be the way they are. And um, I'm not interested in. I don't give a fuck about the industry anymore. Like this entire entertain- entertainment industry could suck my fucking masculine dick. And, <laughs> masculine. Um, I, I said masculine because they're trying to emasculate our penises. Now listen, um, <laughs> because having a masculine dick is apparently bad nowadays. But um, <laughs> but I don't care. I don't care about the studios. I don't care about the networks. We live in a time now where you don't need to have a fucking master no more. And I'm quite happy being a runaway slave. Kill your masters. Kill your masters. That's right, because the Indian people were slaves in South Africa. We were brought there as slaves. <laughs> you know what's funny is my dad was born in 1925. Mm-hmm. My dad used to tell me when I was a kid, he saw in the newspaper in the 30s ads for, for slaves for indentured indentured labor. Oh. Mm-hmm. So you could go to Guyana, you could go to Trinidad, you go to South Africa, and you will be paid to work the land, and you will get a ticket back to India. And it was never the case. Right. So it was a one-way trip. It's trafficking. Yeah. But Shout the, out to caste systems. Not us. Not my family. Shit. <laughs> We'd be low on that fucking tone. But you know, on a side note, just get back to the very beginning of the interview when you talk about Anglo-Indians. Mm-hmm. You know who some famous Anglo-Indians are? Engelbert Humperdinck and Cliff Richard. I didn't know Engelbert Humperdinck was an Anglo-Indian. Engelbert Humperdinck's name is Arnold Dorsey. He was born and raised in Madras, I'm India. like Sir Ben Kingsley. Right. Arnold was, uh, Engelbert was born in, Madras, India, which is now Chennai. And he lived there until he was about 12, and then he moved to England. And then he just claimed England after that. And Cliff Richard uh, was born in Lucknow, India, where my, funny enough, where my dad went to school. And uh, he went to England and became Sir Cliff Richard. So there you go, folks. Things aren't always what you seem. With Talib Kweli. 
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the People's Party is proud to have Russell Peters in the place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.